In some point in your ministry, you are going to have to lead through a change process. You're going to have to convince your leadership team and your church to change in some way. And that change could be anything from you have to make a change to grow to you have to stop doing something that you used to do that everybody loved. You have to start doing something that you've never done that everybody fears. (laughs) You have to, at some point, lead through the process of change in your church. In this episode, I'm going to talk about a few of my favorite books regarding leading change inside of a church setting. But we're really going to focus on my absolute all-time favorite best book there is on how to lead change in your church. We'll get to that in a second, what it is. I'm going to leave you hanging because I want I want you to keep watching <laughs> or listening. This is the Preaching Donkey Podcast. My name's Lane. Welcome. I'm so glad that you're here. If you haven't yet, go to preachingdonkey.com slash 21 days. Pick up your t- free 21-day guide to creating killer sermons. It's a three-week, three-step process that will walk you through how to create and deliver a compelling message. So whether you've been preaching for a long time or you've been preaching for just a short time and you're looking for something to help you get started, there's something in there for you no matter what your experience level is. Pre- preachingdonkey.com slash 21 days. Go there, check it out. You'll love it. All right. Five best books on leading change. We'll start here. Now, I do want to mention that this list is a few years old. I wrote this in 2018, so it's almost six years old, but some of these books are really tried and true. The book that we're going to focus on, though, that is the main thing I don't care how old it is. It's the best book you're going to read on this topic. Number five, Who Stole My Church by Gordon McDonald. Here's why I like this book. I like this book, especially if you are in an older congregation where you're doing a revitalization. If you're doing a revitalization effort in your church, which I had a I had a major part in a church revitalization for about 10 years. I was working at a, at a church in the Northern Virginia, D.C. area here in the U.S. There was so many things in that 10 years that I was there. And the longer I was there, especially the last three years of those 10 years, those last three years that I was there, I had the most, I was closest to the table. I was at the table leading through changes. And there were changes, everything from considering uh, a name change, which never actually went through. I, I wish it had, it had not, to changing our worship style, to changing our service times. Like we, we had everything on the table from big to small to somewhat trivial to a big deal. And because it was an older established church, not necessarily an old congregation in terms of their age, but the church has been around a long time, definitely a contingency of older people and younger people, and two really two competing visions for the future. So we had to lead through what what is the future here going to look like? What do we want it to look like? What is God calling us to? So this this made me very passionate about getting help to lead through change. So Who Stole My Church by Gordon McDonald, the reason why I like that is it helped me understand what the older people in our congregation were going through and how they were processing the way we talked about change. Because I was in my 20s at the time. I was 27, 28, 29, 30. And I was really fired up and convinced about some changes we need to make. And we needed to make in order to go into the future. But to these people, they saw it as a massive threat to what they were comfortable with. And they saw it as a as a affront to the past that they were attached to and they loved. And they felt like it was dishonoring the past. This just made me frustrated as a young leader because I was too arrogant and immature to listen. But reading a book like that really helped me to understand. Same thing with Who Moved My Pulpit. This book is a little bit different. It's not necessarily from the perspective of the congregation, like Who Stole My Church, like why are all these changes happen? But it's more like when you feel like as the leader, like you're being left behind to a newer generation. Uh, there's there's going to be something in there for you. Now, where it gets really good is starting with book three. The third one on my list is Leading Change by John Cotter. Now, I will say, if you have not read Leading Change, this is not my number one book for church change leadership, but it is a must read for anyone in any organization who is leading through change in some way. Cotter just... He, he, his thoroughness, the way he backs it up with data, the way that he brings in both a corporate experience and it's applicable to the church world, uh, amazing. You, you have to read Leading Change at some point. Now, the second one is another book by him called A Sense of Urgency. 
So one of the principles that Cotter teaches in Leading Change is about creating a sense of urgency. This was probably my biggest takeaway from Leading Change, that change can't be, if, if change is going to happen in a church, it can't be something that everybody feels like, yeah, that, that's a nice to have. Wouldn't it be nice if? It can't be that way. Change has to be something that you invite people to feel the urgency along with you. So when you put leading change by Cotter together with a sense of urgency by Cotter, you put those two things together and you have a pretty powerful thing. Now, all that to say, where I want to spend the bulk of the rest of our time together is number one, leading change without losing it by Kerry Newhoff. Now, Kerry Newhoff, ever since he wrote this book, he wrote this book a long time ago, 10 years ago maybe. And since then, he has become a household name in the evangelical world. He wrote this book before anybody even knew who in the heck he even was, 2012, 11 years ago. Before the Kerry Newhoff Leadership Podcast, before we all knew him, we all loved him. He wrote this book a long time ago, and, and honestly, I think it's the best book he's ever written. Not that his new books aren't great. I've got one of them. Uh, I've, I actually have a couple. The Conversations book, I have the Didn't See It Coming. But in terms of what our discussion today, there is just nothing like leading change without losing it. Five strategies that can revolutionize how you lead change when facing opposition. Now, I'm going to go through... Those five strategies in this book, we're going to talk a little bit about his experience and what he did. But first of all, I want to tell you, buy this book. Like, go buy it on Amazon. Like, go right now, pull up an Amazon browser, buy the book. Buy a copy for everybody on your team. I did this when we were leading through some stuff. I bought a copy of this for every one of our elders and every staff person so that they could have a new paperweight because they didn't read it. But I, uh, I put it in front of them and I said, this will give us a way of doing this that will be effective and will have the least harm on everybody involved. I'm telling you, please read this book. And of course, none of them did. All right, here's what he says. I'm gonna read a lot of excerpts from this book and, uh, and you're gonna love it. In the first seven years, he said, we navigated the following changes. I'm gonna read these changes because I want you to see whatever you're facing, he's done it. And he's done it like at a big level. We changed our style of worship from very traditional to very contemporary style. That sounds so dated, but what else do you call it? So even in 2012, it was dated to say contemporary. You know, he did a worship style change. That's a big deal. That's a huge deal. At the church that I was trying to lead change at, we had we had the old model of doing, we still did two worship styles and two like very big services. At one point we had three services, but when I left, we had two services that were different worship styles and decidedly different. At the kind of mid-morning service, we were doing the, I would say 90s contemporary, you know, you had five like middle-aged people with mom jeans and a, and a microphone and they're going, my life is in you, Lord, my strength, you know, that, that thing. And then at the later morning service, like 11 o'clock, we were doing like our best rendition of Hillsong United at the time. And so what it, what it made was two very different churches. <laughs> like we had one, one, one church with two very different groups of people. Some people who went to that earlier service felt like what we did at uh, the 11 o'clock, the modern worship, they thought that was like the devil, right? And some people that were at the modern service would never ever go to the mid-morning 90s contemporary service. It put us in a put us in a tough spot sometimes. We moved from an insider focus to outsiders we needed to reach. So he says, uh, along with changing the worship style, they moved from insider to outsider. This is a big deal. If you're in a church that primarily is designed as the church for the church, by the church, and you're trying to change kind of the target of who you're trying to reach, that's a big deal. Because if people aren't on board with that mission, they're not going to like everything that comes with that. Because if you do it right, you're gonna start attracting people who don't know Jesus, who don't have a church background, who are new to faith or exploring faith. And that can be kind of messy. They're also gonna feel a little bit left out because you're not pandering to them all the time. You're pandering to new people now. Pandering may not be the best word. We reprogrammed all the ministries and stopped doing things like potlucks, bake sales, bazaars. I love the word bazaar because I think like I think of that song, how bizarre, how bizarre, how bizarre. But this is a difference, B-A-Z-A-A-R-S. And fundraisers so we could focus on ministry. Bazaars and fundraisers so they could focus on ministry. So think about this. This is like when you're getting rid of a sacred cow that's been there for a long time. People don't like that. They they feel they feel like you've you've cheated on them. 
We sold all three historic buildings and became a new church with a new mission, new name, and new place. Now, a little context here. He was leading three different congregations within the Presbyterian denomination in Canada. So he would preach at one church and then drive over, preach at the other church, drive over, preach at the other church on a Sunday. And these were small, historic Presbyterian churches. Sold all those assets, like got rid of all that, took that money, bought a new building, new mission, new name. That's a lot of changes, right? That's a lot of people at three different congregations that he's having to navigate through. So dude's a beast. No wonder why he is uh, crushing it these days. After a few years in an elementary school, we moved into a new $2.1 million facility. Now this was, you know, he wrote the book in 2012 when he bought that $2.1 million facility was probably somewhere in the early 2000s. So in today's dollars, 2.1 million would be 97 million, something like that. We remodeled our governance and moved towards a staff led model. That's another big difference, right? When you're changing the way leadership is done, that's huge. Uh, I'm, I'm guessing it was probably very like elder focus, led by session, led by committee, and they went to staff leadership. To be truthful, he says, there was almost nothing we didn't change. And in just over 10 years, we grew from 50 in worship to 800. That's pretty awesome. So here's what I'm saying. You may or may not want to lead through the changes that he led through. You may be saying, well, I don't want to go to a staff-led model or I, I don't want to sell my buildings and change my name. Cool. Insert whatever the leadership thing that you're trying to change is. And I'm telling you, these five changes, these five strategies are exactly what you need. And I'm going to give them to you and then you're going to read the book because he just does a much better job than I will. Number one, do the math. Strategy number one, and here it is. I'm reading from the actual paper book. I I, I abused, I used and abused this book so much that it's literally falling apart. Like I'm, I'm having to hold it together as I'm talking to you if you're watching this. Do the math. Here's what he says. Do the math. And what you're wanting to do here is calculate who is actually opposed, right? Who is actually opposed? So when you are initiating some type of change, there is always going to be a loud but usually small contingency of opposing voices. People who do not want you to do it. Why do they not want you to do it? Because it's not what they're used to, because it threatens the status quo, because maybe in this new model, they won't be as important as they once were. I once heard it said that people don't fear change, they fear loss. So a lot of times when people are opposed to it, they think that it's because they're going to lose something in this exchange. So. They come at you. And what he says is that you want to get an accurate view of how many people are actually opposed. He asked two questions. How much actual opposition is there? And then number two, of all the voices you hear, which ones should guide you? Those are two really important questions. How, many, how much opposition is there and um, which one should guide you? He says, if you don't learn how to do the math of opposition as a leader, you'll let your emotions, not the math, guide your hearing. This was, this was, the reason why this was huge to me is because often what would happen is we would be in these discussions, right? As the, the, the elder board, I would, I would sit there with them. And as a pastor, I was a you know pastor. We had unpaid elders. We had paid pastors. We were all sitting at the table talking about whatever we're going to do. And someone would bring up, well, such and such person that I've, you know, has gone here for years, they don't like this idea. And then someone else would say, yeah, I heard from such and such person, they don't like it either. And all of a sudden, the entire room shifts and everybody goes, well, the, the idea must be dangerous. It must be, it must be something we shouldn't do. We, we must avoid this idea because to do so would be to go down an unwise road. And I read this and I thought, hey, how, how can we have a better, more accurate understanding of who actually doesn't like this and who is actually fine with it, but because they're fine with it, they're not saying anything. And so it's 99% of people that are totally cool with it. They're, they'll go where they're, where, where they're led if we lead well and cast a compelling vision, but there's a few people who aren't there yet and we can't give them an outsized voice. In fact, one of the things he says, he says, Loud does not equal large and volume does not equal velocity. So loud doesn't mean large and volume doesn't mean velocity. 
So just because they're loud doesn't mean there's a lot of them. And just because they have a lot of volume doesn't mean that they're getting anywhere with it. All right, so strategy one, there's a whole lot more to do the math, but that is the first strategy. Number two is choose your focus. This is where you are going to have to decide whether you will focus on who you want to reach or who you want to keep. All right, this is a massive, massive deal when you are leading change. There's there's a tendency to look at your church, really anything, your business, your church, your home, your family, through a scarcity mentality or an abundance mentality. When it comes to leading change, what can happen is, is you can have a scarcity mentality. You can say, okay, we have 400 people in attendance right now. If we, if we do this change, we could lose 200 people. And then what's going to happen? We're going to, we're not going to be able to pay our bills. They'll stop paying their pastor, which means I'll have to go somewhere else and I'll, it'll, I'll be a failure. It'll be embarrassing. I will have killed the church and everyone will hate me, right? That's scarcity. An abundance mentality would say, okay, if we lead this change, we'll, we might go from 400 to 200, 200 people might leave right away. Got it. But this, this is going to allow us, this change is what's necessary to allow us to grow. So if we wait this out and we lead well, then we could go from 400 to 200 possibly, and then back up to 400 and then further than we would have gone 600, 800. And again, it's not just about the numbers. It's just that numbers are an indication that when it, when it comes to it, the reason why everybody's afraid to change anything is they don't want to lose attendees and they don't want to lose dollars. And so what I'm saying is, is that you, when you have a scarcity mentality, you think if we make this change, we are going to lose both attendees and dollars and we won't be able to do ministry anymore and I'll be a failure and it'll be embarrassing. And that's scarcity. The problem with that way of thinking is it keeps you from making any moves at all. And so instead of growing, you just stay the same and you end up shrinking. We looked at our church, our numbers year over year, and we were just holding still, just holding steady as a church, but really we were declining. Because if you're not growing, you're declining, especially where we were in DC, where it's very transient, people are moving in and out all the time. And if you're not attracting new people and you're losing old people because they're moving out of the area, it's not good. One of the most important questions you will ever answer as a leader is this, will you focus on the people you wanna reach or will you focus on the people you want to keep? Now, of course, the church must do both, reach the unbeliever and disciple the insider. This is not about serving one to the exclusion of the other, but it's easy to forget that people not in the room, it's, okay, here we go. I, I don't want to read this wrong. This is so good. But it's easy to forget about the people not in the room because we only hear from people who are in the room. That's huge. That's huge. Okay. That's strategy number two. You have to decide where you're going to focus. Strategy number three, find a filter, find a filter, develop the questions that will help you shape your future, right? So you have to be asking the right questions. He says, as a leader, you need to find a filter. You have so many voices coming at you that you may not be sure whose voice to listen to. So this kind of goes back to doing the math, right? How much opposition really is there? It kind of goes back to what we talked about, who are we focusing on, people we want to reach or people we want to keep. This is of the voices that we hear and of the people who are here and the people that we we're going to keep, what is our filter? Who are we actually going to listen to? That's an important question to, to answer. How do I make sense of the voices raised in disagreement with the vision. How do I make sense of this? In order to ac accommodate the current and future growth and position ourselves for ministry to a fundamentally different culture that had emerged over the last 50 years, he said, we would sell all three century old buildings and create a new church on a new site with a new name. Essentially, we were asking people whose great grandparents started the church to leave the past behind them, including their buildings. These were the buildings in which many of them had been baptized, in which many of them had been married, in which their own children had come to faith, all for an unknown future in a temporary location. It was brand new territory for all of us. Naturally, he says, the proposal had its critics, both from within and without. Many people told me that what we were attempting to do was unprecedented uh, and that it was unlikely to work. And of course, the proposal evoked deep emotions among many in the congregation. How could we leave all this behind and start over again to reach people we didn't even know? They, they, were, they were all the questions. Congregational meetings became hard. People would yell, scream. You know, I'm kind of paraphrasing. Here's what he says. I'm not exactly sure how it happened, but I do remember that it happened. I developed a filter. 
he, Newhoff says, I sat down with our elders one night and said, we need to come up with a method of sifting through the voices that we were hearing informally at first. And then we very decidedly, we developed two questions through which we, we process every negative voice we heard. Number one, is there a biblical argument in what the person is saying? Number two, is this person the kind of person we are going to build the future of the church on? <laughs> Those are two really good questions. Let me talk about the first one. Often when people are afraid of a change, they don't want you to change something in some way. What they're hanging on to is not anything that's biblical or gospel centered. They're just hanging on to their preference or tradition, which is fine. But often when you get into the church world, they will come at you as if it's more spiritual than that, right? They'll say, we can't change our name because we've had Baptists in our name since John. John was a Baptist, right? John the Baptist. He wasn't John the Methodist. He wasn't John the Presbyterian. He was John the Baptist. So we need to keep Baptists on our side if we're going to be faithful. No, that's not a biblical argument. And then is this person the kind of person we are, and by the way, I'm not I'm not mad at Baptist. I was a Baptist for a long time, so I'm not mad at you. I'm just saying I was in a church where I was trying to help them see that what we were doing as a church and what we were calling ourselves as a church were two different things. And the name was starting to become a barrier to our community, not a bridge. And the argument against that was, well, are we just going to throw the gospel out next? And the answer is no, we're not. And that's not a biblical argument either. Number two, is this person the kind of person we are going to build the future of our church on? Yeah, that's that's a good question. Is this somebody that is this somebody that we uh, everything we're doing here is kind of built around this type of person? And if the answer is no, just make that hard decision. All right, so that's strategy number three. Strategy number four, uh, and this is hard. This is probably the hardest one. Attack problems, not people. Attack problems, not people. Help people see you are for them, even if you are not for their ideas. Help people see that you're for them, even if you're not for their ideas. He says, when somebody attacks you or your ideas, it's hard not to get defensive or even counterattack. Yes, <laughs> man. When I, I, when I was um, in, in that church, and it's not the only time I've led through changes, but it's, it was the most pronounced because the changes were needed. And I remember there were times where you know, I would think through uh, every possible angle of a change that I was convinced we needed to make. I would consult with consultants and other pastors. I would look at case studies. I would read books about it. I would even write papers about it and distribute it to the elders and all this. And then there would always be one elder who would sit at the table and cross his arms like this and just hurl an insult at me like I was an idiot. And I knew that he didn't know one 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 hundredth of what I knew about this this issue that that he because he's successful as a accountant or he's on the board at Lockheed we decide he's he's a good he he should be an elder it's like oh you you've been a Christian for a long time and you're a dude why don't you come boss us around <laughs> that that was this church's position anyway and so I sat there and thought uh, I would get really, really angry at, at people like that. Like I would sit there and, you know, my livelihood was attached to this. So I couldn't get as insulting as they would get. But I remember sitting at those meetings on those Saturday mornings and uh, I'd come home and I would just be spent and mad and depressed because they would take something that they just didn't know anything about and they would tear it down because they didn't understand it. And it would just... It would make me incensed, enraged, I tell you. And I, I had to learn. I, I read this book and I was like, okay, I, I can't attack that person. They just don't know. And because they don't know, that's the problem. Let's attack that. Let's help them understand. And then if they understand and, they, and they're still willfully ignorant or still... And, I, and by the way... I'm not saying that everybody had to agree with me. I just wanted them to have an accurate understanding of what we were even talking about. And when I felt like that wasn't accomplished and that they didn't even care, that's what made me mad. So don't come at me for that because if you've ever been in that situation 
and you care what's going on. You know what I'm talking about. When someone attacks you or your ideas, it's hard not to get defensive and even counterattack. Talked about that, but it's not a particularly helpful skill if you're trying to navigate change, especially when you're trying to navigate in a Christian context as a Christian leader. I was doing a slow burn as leader. I didn't realize I didn't really see a safe place to take my frustration, anger, and growing resentment. My problem wasn't that I attacked people in public. My problem was that I let the attack simmer internally. Yeah, of course. Of course, right? Like we sit there in the meeting and we, hmm, yeah, thanks, Jim. Thanks for saying all that stuff. And and we just were thinking, I, you know, I hope God takes care of Jim. And when I say takes care of Jim, I mean like the way the mafia takes care of someone. All right. Okay, so let's keep going. There's one more strategy of this of this thing. Don't quit. That's what he says. Don't quit. Persevere until your critical breakthrough. He says, the challenges you're facing right now are moments you will one day look back on as the good old days, provided you don't quit before your breakthrough. Sometimes the opposition isn't someone who doesn't like an idea, but external factors that seem to conspire against you. He says, we're often tempted to quit or give up moments before our critical breakthrough. We need to give God permission to write a story that we can't write ourselves. And I think there, it's, it's a little bit, there's a spiritual component to change leadership. And that cannot be lost. And that's why I love what he says here. He says, while the timeline isn't bankable, some change theorists suggest that change can happen in three to five years. But transformative change doesn't happen until the seventh year. The power in that idea is that change takes time. Think about your own life. Think about what God does in you. Think about your sanctification process. It is not instantaneous. It takes time. It is an effort over a lifetime of becoming more like Jesus and less not like Jesus. But the true transformation takes even more. Because of the time required to affect change and transformation, you are likely to be tempted to quit before your critical breakthrough. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, I I hope you can see there's more to this book than what I read you. Those are the five steps. Buy the book or don't buy the book. I don't care. I don't think Kerry cares anymore. He's he's selling plenty of other stuff. But if if you want a really, really, really good resource to put in the hands of people, and what's cool is uh, it's only like 115 pages, and there's not a whole lot of words on each page because <laughs> there's a lot of spaces between the paragraph. So you can give it to someone. It's more like a workbook. It's more like a little pamphlet that you can put in, in in your leadership team's lap and say, hey guys and gals, this is something you need to, like we all need to go through this together. It'll give you a common language for change. I hope that helps. If you have thoughts and comments and you're watching here on YouTube, please share them down below. Can't wait to see you next week here at the Preaching Donkey Podcast. Until then, remember if God can speak through a donkey, he can speak through you and he can speak through me. We'll see you next time here at the Preaching Donkey Podcast.